doubt about it. We're there. So when do you guys start? Take take me back. Uh, what's your early? Go ahead. Whoever wants that's, to start. That's our memory too, Joe. Well, first of all, Joe, th thanks so much for having us. I mean, uh, really, really appreciate your inviting us to, to to talk with you, and and we love talking about the Eastern League too. Obviously, I mean, what you just described is our history too. Jay and I started going to the games when we were maybe I don't know seven, eight years old. Our dad started taking us and. Jay and I have been best friends since kindergarten. We went to grade school together. Uh, you know, we took a, a break for high school. He was at Scranton Central. I was at prep with your brother um, and you uh, a couple of years behind us. And uh, then Jay and I went to college together at Georgetown and been friends all through life. And we'd always, whenever we get together, say, you know, we, we would share memories of the Eastern League. I mean, we were huge fans, Jay. Uh, uh, went to all the games and, and, and he'll tell you about his history with the Packers. And uh, we'd always say, you know, we should write a book. So Jay and I both had careers that involved writing of some kind. And uh, a few years ago, we said, you know, now's that time to start that book. So uh, we started talking with the players and, and, and Eastern leaguers and in a number of respects and worked about three years on it, but uh, we have the book. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's been most gratifying is so many people like us and like you are huge, huge Eastern League fans. And that book brings back great memories for us, for the players, for the communities. It was a special thing. You know, Jay, go, you, know, you, you, you take it. You, you describe you know, some of your experiences on this. Oh, definitely. I uh, clearly, clearly remember going with my dad. Uh, I think it was 1962 or 63. And, and we uh, <laughs> ended up having the same seats every time at every game. Um, we, uh, I later uh, worked as a statistician for the uh, Scranton uh, Apollos and um, got to uh, got to know the uh, Pactor family who owned the Scranton team and actually owned uh, late, late, later years, the Wilkes-Barre team. And um, uh, just, it was, it was part of our lives. I tell you one thing though, that, that Sue and I have, have talked about, we regret that uh, we should have started sooner on the, on the research for the book because, you know, these players, uh, you know, aging and, and uh, uh, we lost many, Many of the players, um, uh, including recently, uh, who you know we would have loved to have uh, you know had in the book, um, and so on. Like for example, John Cheney, the great coach of uh, Temple University, he he passed away recently. Art Pactor passed away just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, great guy. Um, the players loved playing for him. Um, you had uh, you know Howie Landa, who. Uh, re uh, passed away, Richie Cornwall. So that that's the one thing we say that boy, if we if we had to do it over again, we would have started a lot sooner. And, and certainly, both of you touched upon it. What have you come What have you come away with when you find? Uh, I don't know. I, and I didn't, I'll be honest with you. I, I didn't read the entire book yet. When you find one of these uh, former Eastern leaguers, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I a couple of days ago, I talked to Joe Lally from Dunmore. Okay, a uh, Scranton yep. minor, just one season, I think it was 68, 69. All he had to say was positive things about it, he, you know, and talking about the Pactors, Art Pactor, saying like, what a great guy it was. And, and, and the transportation he was talking about, like, I think he went to, uh, oh, I, uh, why, he went to school like in the DC area. So he was talking how he would drive by car on these long trips that just love to play basketball. From talking to the successful players. Joe, jo Joe uh, Lally uh, told me that uh, here's, here's something that uh, n not uh, something he loved. He said he almost got killed in two separate incidents. And this, that's from driving home late at night to get back to, to work in the next morning. You know, game, the game ends at like 11, um, shower or whatever, and uh, get in a car. Uh, a lot of times in snow, and uh, he said that he he just made it, just made it in those in those situations. And certainly, you guys touched upon it. I, I know in the book, uh, 
about some of the referees. Dick, Dick Vivette has a couple good stories. Uh, the, the, the fans knew the refs. I mean, and they knew the players. I mean, as you guys say, uh, you know, some of the players maybe are, are, are fans yeah, never heard of. But if you were a fan from the Eastern League, you knew these players. And, and certainly, you know, talk a little about that. Well, I mean, that's it, John. I mean, what, what, what you're touching on is that it, it, was, it was a close-knit community. Uh, Art Packer used to call it a family. And it really was. Um, you know, we were so close to the players. We, they were playing in small high school gyms. And after the games, you know, they'd mill around waiting for the carpool to go back to Philly or New York or wherever. And we'd hang around and we'd start talking to them. But, you know, in going back, you know, he asked about some of the takeaways, some of the things we found as we talked to, to former Eastern leaguers. It, it wasn't only, you know, their love of playing and everyone we talked to. Jim Beheim, who was, you know, not necessarily an effusive uh, a guy, just was so excited to talk about his experiences playing in the Eastern League. It meant so much to him. It meant so much to all of them. Uh, it, it was such an important part of their lives, so much to all of the fans. And the thing that, that we came away with was, you know, we admired these, these players when we were kids. We loved them. We worshipped them. They were our stars, our heroes. And to find out that they were as great people as they were basketball players, you know, so many of them went on to great careers as coaches and teachers and in business. You know, Swish McKinney, who was beloved in Scranton, Swish turned out, you know, he never graduated. Well, he when he was playing for Scranton, he was just a high school graduate. Swish's story, which is really interesting, is that he basically finished high school at 16. Um, the, 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 the principal said, you know, you've taken all of our courses here. You got to leave. He said, but I want to stay. I want to play basketball. They said, we don't have any more courses for you. He was a very smart, innately intelligent guy. So Swish left high school at 16 because he had finished everything the high school had to offer for him ended up in the army, uh, ended up in Panama. He was assigned to Panama where he was put in charge of, of, a, of a, a, a rec center, a gym. So Swish would play 10, 12 hours a day, shooting, playing pickup, and got to be an all army basketball player. Um, had a tryout with the St. Louis Hawks and you know came to Scranton. When he ended up in IBM in, in Binghamton uh, with uh, Mr. Minio, uh, who traded, you know, Mr. Packer traded a, a Swish from Scranton to Binghamton, he got a job with IP, IBM, and it turned out Swish had this innate facility for computers, computer science. So he worked for IBM, uh, ended up going back home to Oakland, got a degree in computer science, and he had a long career, both uh, 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 as, a, as a, a, an IT guy at a bank in, in California and teaching uh, information technology. So, so many of these guys were as accomplished in their professional careers as they were as basketball players. And that's the big thing, you know, you got to realize. Um, we think, oh, Eastern League, they were our guys. You know, look at the numbers. Back then in the 50s and 60s, there were eight, nine, 10 teams in the NBA, right? 10 players per team. So that's 80 to 100 guys in the NBA. I mean, today there's 30 teams, 15 players, 450 guys in the NBA, 100, 450. So these guys we saw in the Eastern League would be, in the Eastern League, they'd be, they'd be NBA players, and some of them would be all-stars today. You know, we saw great, great players, and they were up close, and we got to know them. What a special thing we had, you know? What a special thing we had. What a great opportunity we had to watch these great, great players uh, up close. We were, watching, we were watching NBA caliber basketball in Scranton, in Wilkes-Barre, and Hazleton, you know, and Sunbury, and Williamsport. It was so cool. And uh, you, you mentioned the Atlanta Hawks, which made me think of uh, Charlie Chris. Oh, NBA, Chris. All, this, all this work. What did he have, 73 that one game? What was that thing? I, I, was well, it 72, yeah. I think? Like, okay, maybe 72. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 72. And, and there's a story to that, too, uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind my telling it. The story to that one is uh, uh, Charlie Chris played for a team that disbanded. So there was a dispersal draft. And uh, Hazleton, coached by Sonny Hill, had the first draft. And everyone expected, oh, Sonny Hill, you know, small little guard, he's going to take Charlie Chris in the first round. 
and he didn't. Don't know why, but he did it. So Scranton picked up Charlie Chris in the second round. So the first time that season, Stan Novak, coach of, of, of the Miners, who was also a legendary coach and went on to be a scout in the NBA. Um, Stan Novak tells Charlie, I want you to score tonight. And Charlie's been averaging 30 some points a game. He said, well, I have been scoring. He said, no, I mean, really scored tonight. But Charlie went off for 72 points against Sunny Hill and Hazleton. That <laughs> was Stan's little way of getting back at him. So they had fun. And that, yeah, I mean, there's so many stories. And yeah, Jay's got as many as I do. I mean, it, it was a great, it was a great experience talking to these guys. How about to talk a little bit about? Let's go back just to the and I I apologize to the beginning. I believe it is in 1946, and really when they were when they were trying to sell the EBA, we would always say it. I remember being like a, a college student. It's the oldest professional basketball league in the nation. What what's the story behind that? Like who, how did how did the whole idea come about? Do you guys know? You know what I mean? The whole kind of you know we put stuff together. I mean, and and heard a few things. It it, it was. You know, right after World War II, and there was kind of, you know, soldiers coming back, many of whom have had college basketball experience, and um, uh, a whole bunch of, you know, people uh, who now suddenly had money to spend and wanted entertainment, and it was an upbeat mood, so it was like this gold rush. A lot of minor leagues, semi-pro leagues were forming, you know, and, and Pro basketball was a, was really just sort of starting off. You had an American Basketball League and a National Basketball League who were kind of competing. Uh, barnstorming teams like the Globe Trotters and Harlem Wrens were still really big. Um, you had these semi-pro leagues that were kind of rough and tumble in Pennsylvania, and uh, some of the owners. You know, the story I hear is that Eddie White, who was the longtime owner and coach of the Wilkes-Barre kind of wanted to try to get a team in this new league that was forming called the Basketball Association of America, BAA. And he didn't. So he and some of the other guys who'd been in semi-pro league said, well, we want something better than the semi-pro, but we can't get into this top league. So let's form our own league. Uh, and they called it the Eastern League. And they actually, there was a meeting at the Alhambra Hotel in Hazleton in, in 1946, April, 1946 where the Eastern Basketball League was formed, Eastern Professional, that was the key. The Eastern Professional was the key word, that they wanted to distinguish themselves from the semi-pro leagues, which were you know, kind of real rough-edged leagues. Um, and and they, they formed, and it was six weeks before the BAA, the Basketball Association of America, formally formed. Um, so that's why, yes, they predated the BAA. The BAA ended up merging with the NBL in 1949, and that became the NBA. So yes, they did predate the predecessor of the NBA by six weeks. Um, and, and the irony of the whole thing is Eddie White was one of the prime movers behind the Eastern League, and his Barons uh, won the championship against the Lancaster team at the end of the 1946-47 season, and both teams jumped to the a ABL at the end of the season. But that's what it was like. I mean, pro basketball was just this real hard scrabble thing just sort of it was kind of like a gold rush and people teams were jumping leagues and players and it all kind of settled out in the early 50s where you ended up having the nba and the other teams the other leagues kind of disappeared and then the eastern league was left as the next best league so by the by 1951 the eastern league was kind of the next best or 1953 the eastern league was next best now to jump and, up and, uh, go ahead go ahead Jay. Joe, i was going to going to mention a couple of other things in that era uh, that was that was important for the the league. You had um, in the early in the, from the 40s to the mid 60s um, unwritten quota on the number of black players on a team. Usually, you'll just see two or three black players on a team, and that's because of this unwritten quota. Um, and what happened to the many great black players who were not uh, taken in the, in the NBA? Well, they went to the Eastern League, and that was a real boost for um, for the, for the uh, for the league. Uh, and for unfortunate for the black black players, but but for the uh, you know that's part of the development of the of, of the game. The other thing I was going to mention was in 1951 there was a, um, a college uh, basketball gambling scandal, and more than 
30 college players uh, were, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, convicted and, um, and um, uh, banned then uh, by the NBA for life. Um, and um, you had great players uh, from that, from that, that uh, era who uh, could not get to the NBA and they went to the Eastern League. One of them who was kind of caught up in this whole gambling scandal, just you know, other people saying he was involved, but he wasn't. Bill Spivey, you might remember him, great, great player. He was, um, uh, you know, going to be the, uh, the the next, uh, the, the great greatest uh, um, center after George Mikan and before Will Chamberlain. Um, he uh, he was never found guilty of anything, and um, but still the NBA would not go back on this uh, ban for, for the, for the, for the, for the uh, gambling. So uh, anyhow, Bill Spivey went to the Eastern League. He played in the league about 10 years, and he was one of the greatest players. I was going to say, and, and I, I remember Spivey, and uh, I remember his height, which, which today is probably not too, you know, obviously in the NBA, there's probably taller players, but I remember in Scranton, I think he I maybe was listed at 7'2 or something, and I just got the impression, my boy, who's this giant of a guy? Yeah. You know I mean? Now, how about just to fast forward a little bit, and I don't know what comes next, uh, and I'm, certainly I'm familiar with the CBA, and I'm familiar with the ABA. So what happened first as far as, you know, did the ABA, did we start getting players from the ABA, or did players from the Eastern League go to the ABA, or what happened there? You know what I mean? Like in the late 70s, I guess that would have been. It was really the 60s. Uh, 67, 68 was the formation of the American Basketball Association. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for the Eastern League. The Eastern League really, its A day was the mid 50s through the mid 60s. And as Jay was saying, you know, so many great players. I mean, uh, so many great African American players. Uh, I mean, I'll mention names. I think some of them will be familiar uh, to you, Joe. Uh, uh, Hal King Lear, you know, um, uh, uh, Wally Choice, uh, Dick Gaines, Stacey Arsenal. Julius McCoy. These were great players. I mean, these were NBA all-star caliber players. Why weren't they in the NBA? As Jay said, unwritten quota. Uh, two to three players, you know, one guy, Andy Johnson, who used to play for uh, Allentown, his son wrote a book about that era, and he described it as Noah-like. The NBA was letting players in Noah-like, two black players, two by two. And, and that was it, two or three per team. The other thing was the NBA um, wanted their black players to be role players, rebounders, defenders, point guard, passers, not scorers. So what did Wally Choice and Hal Lear and Julius McCoy and Stacey Arsenault all have in common? They were great scorers, you know. And these guys, it's unfortunate. The, you know, today's NBA is built on the shoulders of guys like King Lear and Stacey Arsenault. Uh, and, and Wally Choice. These are great players. I mean, before there was Elgin Baylor, there was Wally Choice. You know, before there was Steph Curry, there was Al King Lear. Great shooter. Al Lear, in, in, in like five or six years, or seven years in the Eastern League, he scored 50 or more points 13 times. I mean, <laughs> you know, great players um, who would be lost to history. And, and one of the things our book does is bring them back. Bill Spivey, as Jay said, what a tragedy, you know, between George Mike and, and Will Chamberlain, there should have been Bill Spivey. Uh, and he knew it. And 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 his wife told, or his, I guess in a newspaper article, we read that his wife, when he died, said he died of a broken heart. He never really got his chance. Um, but fast forward, the ABA starts up in 67, 68. And it's looking for players and it's looking for good players. And it finds the Eastern League. And... Uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 of the Eastern League top players all went to the end to the ABA uh, in the first two seasons of the ABA. I mean, you had Willie Morrell, who was a great player in Scranton, gone. Willie Somerset, gone. Vern Tart, Larry Jones, and Wilkes Barrett, gone. Uh, Walt Simon, uh, you know, on and on. And so many of these were some of the great players in the early years of the ABA. So that showed, you know, the talent they had. But So that took the top layer of talent away from the Eastern League. And I mean, there were still great players. I mean, Stan Pavlik was a great player, one of the all-time greats. 
uh, wait, Bellamy, Swish stayed. Swish did not want to go to the ABA. Uh, he loved he loved Binghamton and Scranton. Um, uh, so 